with OCC and CDC um, and we really try to highlight where applications have infrastructure provision, active travel provision that's not quite compliant with their own guidelines or with more national guidance. We've also established ourselves as stakeholders in larger developments and changes to infrastructure around BISTA. We try to make sure that the active travel provision there is, like I say, safe, effective, easily accessible and quick. And we really want to make active travel an easy choice for BISTA residents to make um, and to make that leap from using you know, their vehicles wherever possible. Now, the University of Oxford found that choosing to travel by bike just once a day can reduce transportation-related emissions by 67%. And it's worth noting that cycling has a carbon footprint of just 33 grams of carbon dioxide per mile travelled. Now, we know that cycling and walking and any form of active travel is really good for the environment. It's really sustainable. But what gets us out onto our bikes, onto, you know, onto our feet on those cold, dreary days when the nights are drawing in is a very human emotion to think, well, what's in it for me? If anybody asks me, usually, why do you cycle, my answer is nearly always I do it for the cake. And then aside from cake, it's also really good for physical health. And that's normally my motivators for getting out on my bike. So the World Health Organization last year looked at the specific effects of active travel on people's health. So this was aside from looking at people going to the gym, going all out on the treadmill, doing an exercise class. They were just looking at people who get exercise just through traveling about their day-to-day -day life. And they found that walking for 30 minutes or cycling for 20 minutes on most days reduces mortality risk by at least 10%. They found that active commuting is associated with around a 10% decrease in cardiovascular disease and a 30% decrease in type 2 diabetes risk. They also found that cancer-related mortality is 30% lower in bike commuters. And then there's the wider effects of just reducing air pollution in general, which reportedly causes more than half a million deaths every year. The government and Active Travel England have acknowledged there has been a huge shift in the last year. So from 2022 to 2023, they found that active travel now accounts for 20% of all minutes of activity taken by adults in the UK. And they, well, Sport England think that this is probably due to the rise of um, cost of living. And they found that this is the largest increase in any activity in any given year. So we are starting to make that shift, even if it's more of a financial motivator. Now, exercise also is really good for our mental well-being. It stimulates the release of chemicals, including endorphins, oxytocin. So it really helps to improve mental well-being and reduces stress and anxiety. I also personally find that it really reduces my stress and anxiety the less I'm driving during the day. I'm a car owner, I'm a driver, I drive when I need to, and I find a huge difference with how I feel before and after a day of work compared to whether I've actively traveled for my job that day or whether I've used the car. Workplaces and schools acknowledge that Active travel from their workers and from school children can aid productivity. They find that people arrive more alert and refreshed. And schools report that children who actively travel to school have better behavior and concentration throughout the day. Now, the school run alone is responsible for generating half a million tons of carbon dioxide per year. There's a wider issue there. There's many, many reasons. Um, why a generation ago, 70% of children walk to school, but now less than half do. And that's a much wider issue that uh, I won't talk about today, but there are many, many more things that we could do on a national level to really help that. If we look at the value of cycling and the economic benefit of active travel on the local community, is that it's really good for the high street. Now, in Bicester, we have a pedestrianized sheep street. There's plans in the pipeline and talks going on about Market Square. And we have got great foundations in BISTA for our high street and to really regenerate our high street and really pull in that economic benefit of active travel. So just worth noting that cycle parking delivers five times the retail spend per square meter than the same area of car parking. 
And over a month, people who walk and cycle to the high street spend up to 40% more than those who drive there. And people who walk and cycle take more trips to the high street over the course of a month. And I can certainly relate to that. If I'm out on my bike, I'm much more likely to stop and shop locally. A study in London found that improving high streets for walking and cycling led to a 216% increase in people stopping, sitting or socialising. And we're already halfway there in Bicester. We've got a lovely sheep street that just needs a bit more seating. It just needs to be a little bit more attractive. And from the Bicester bug point of view, it just needs a little bit more cycle parking. Now, the Department for Transport reports that for every one pound spent on walking and cycling, we get a 13 pounds worth of benefits is returned to the economy. And that's for many reasons. That's for, for example, worker retention in workplaces being higher, in workplaces that promote and enable active travel. And that's also worth noting that the direct NHS saving from an increase in active travel have been estimated at 17 billion pounds over 20 years. Now, healthcare itself has a large carbon footprint. So the more that we can do to help our NHS, it's all those knock-on effects that it then has on the environment at the end of that. It's also good for our pockets. I have a much reduced fuel expenditure because I choose other active tra uh, travel options as much as I can. And the reduced wear and tear on vehicles, my car's more likely to pass its MOT if I've done less miles in a year and it's got a reduced turnover of components and parts. So bike tires are cheaper than car tires, I can say that. Specifically for Bicester, we know that it doesn't take a lot to tip Bicester over when it comes to congestion. So there's lots of roadworks carefully planned in Bicester, but it doesn't take much like a gas pipe works, water pipe works, to really tip Bicester into tailbacks, gridlock. I don't dispute that sometimes the car is the best tool for the job. I use my car. If we can have people on the road in their cars who need to be there, and people who can choose active travel using active travel, it's more pleasant for everybody. It means that when you need to use your car for a job, you can get there with good traffic flow. There's less idling traffic. That's also good for the environment. Now, Oxfordshire County Council do have an active travel strategy. It's available to look at online. It is a really interesting read. And for BISTA, their target is to increase cycle trips to 60,000 per year by 2031 from a current baseline of 20,000. So that's a 200% increase. Now, something we're looking at from BISTA Bug is that the people who are already using their bikes for journeys that's not where we're going to achieve that 200% increase. If you're just using all of the people who are already cycling, I personally can't make a 200% increase. I'm already doing sort of, you know, 80, 90%. So what we're looking at is we need new people to be taking up cycling, and we really want to enable that. So in summary, active travel is good for the environment, it's good for our health, and it encourages sustainable economic growth. And I think if you just look at the, the very small cross-section of photos that I've managed to gather from our members, it feels good. It makes us happy. You know, everybody's smiling. <laughs> now, Bisterbug, we know that it's daunting sometimes to take up cycling when maybe you're not so confident, maybe when um, you haven't done it for a number of years. So what we've got is we've set up a free scheme called the Bike Buddy Scheme. It aims to pair less experienced, less confident bike users with more experienced bike users. It's tailored to the user. We haven't really got a, a strict flow through of how this works, so it's whatever the person wants. If they just want to share some local knowledge, if they just want to change one journey per week for a bike journey and they just want to know how to get there, we can help with that. We can help to overcome any barriers to cycling in Bicester, and sometimes it just takes a friendly face and somebody just being on the end of an email or meeting up for somebody to feel a lot more confident. So I'm going to hand over now to Craig, who's going to talk about electric vehicle ownership. Thank you. Is this all working? Yep, okay. Um, hi, uh, my name's Craig. Uh, I live in Bicester. I'm going to talk about uh, having an electric car. Um, first thing is, I can't compete with that at all. It, it, clear, <laughs> clearly, it's more expensive and it's not as good for your health. Um, 
on an environmental basis, um, it's, the best choice is to, to cycle or use public transport, but we still use cars, and when we do use cars, we've now got a choice of using uh, electric cars instead of petrol cars. Um, I switched over um, about three years ago, which in electric car terms is quite a long time to be, uh, to be using them, so I've got a, a bit of experience. Um, and spoilers, I, they're good, and I like them. Um, so that's good news. Um, I was quite lucky. Uh, a few years ago, there was a centre in Milton Keynes that was allowing people to have extended um, hire trials. So I, I hired one out for a week. I knew at some point I was going to be changing a car. And I thought it'd be nice to go electric, um, to be more environmental. Um, it might cost more, be a hassle, or not be very good, but it might, might be worth it. Um, on that basis, so tried it out. It turns out it was um, it, it was good as well. Um, that's my old car on the top left. It was a lovely 17-year-old now Honda Civic, um, and the white car is the uh, Volkswagen ID3 that we hired uh, uh, for that week. Um, and then there's, there's a few main questions. Uh, I mean, certainly there's a lot of misinformation out about electric cars at the moment. It's a very sort of hot button topic uh, if you're online at all. Um, so there's a couple of main questions that come up uh, about cost and about charging, they're, they're, they're big issues. There are a few other things that surprised me long before, long before I got to that with just my little experience. Um, the first thing, and this is probably the thing I end up talking to people most about when they ask me what it's like, uh, what's the main benefit? It's not, it's not the carbon savings, it's not the cost savings, it's the fact that you can switch the air con on before you get in the car. Um, you can't do it with a petrol car. You can't leave the engine. You can't switch them on without the engine running. You can't do it remotely. So you can. Uh, when it's cold, you get in there and it's already warm. When it's hot in the summer, you get in there. It's already nice and chilled for you. I never have to scrape ice off my car. I did that long, long before I got into it. So uh, I probably enjoy that more than anything else. Um, they got more space in them. It's, again, not something that's mentioned a lot, but. Uh, to do, I mean, I'm not a mechanic either. There's, some, there's a drivetrain that's not there. The wheels can go further out to the edges. It means that uh, for the equivalent size car on the, on the outside, they have more space on the inside. A lot of them, as you see from those pictures, have uh, boots in the front. It's an extra bit of space there. I think our personal best as a family is having 12 pairs of shoes in it. So it is, it is, it is a useful bit of bonus there. Um, I mean, they're more, you know, they're not polluting. Obviously, less carbon emissions overall. Um, but the, the the local emissions of the exhaust pipe as well. Just when I, in the past I've sat on the driveway with the engine running, loading up the car, and my daughter. So at the time I hired that car three years ago, she was three years old, exactly at exhaust pipe height, and she's wandering around there. And you and you're really conscious of sat on a driveway, going, oh, it's, it doesn't smell bad here. And the same anywhere in clothes, so, you know, indoor car park, places like that. You do notice that lack of, like, what? Well, now, like, uh, just a few years on, I'm thinking, what, why on earth do we have these, like, things pumping poison right in people's, you know, in the areas where we're standing? It seems bizarre now, but you really notice that on a local level. Um, they're very quiet uh, on the inside uh, uh, as well. So um, on our journeys, I found that you can have conversations without raising your voice, even on the motorway. You can listen to music, podcasts. You can um, have a sleep in the back. Uh, it's, it's a very peaceful thing. Find at the end of a long journey, just much more sort of rested and um, uh, not so just, I don't know, stressed. Uh, it's a very peaceful place to be. Um, and another a bizarre quirk of some of them is that they are power sources as well, as well as putting electricity into them, a lot of them, and in future this will be all of them. Um, you can use them to power other things. So um, like anything that uses a three pin plug, so ca camping things, uh, pneumatic drilling if you do that on the move, uh, um, electric bike charging there, and you can use them to power up other cars as well. So. Um, uh, there's lots of creative uses for them. I, know, I think I've used my hedge trimmer out the front with it. But just um, in power cuts is probably a more sensible option. Um, you can just run a, run a cable into your house. And at a minimum, you can keep the fridge and the freezer running and some lights and things. Um, I've certainly had that. But it, you know, ultimately, we're moving towards powering your whole house. The size of uh, battery in the car I've got um, would power my house for a week. So it's, it's, it's quite, quite useful. Um, and if you're learning to drive, they're very easy to drive. They're very smooth, they're very simple, they don't have gears. Um, so you'd get an automatic license driving one like an automatic car, but even compared to an automatic petrol car, they're very 
just smooth and quiet and simple, really, really easy um, for either learners or if you're someone who's not, not that into driving. Um, if you're into trials going fast, uh, then, <laughs> as you mentioned, they do that too. But, um, that's that's uh, not the main reason. So the two main things I wanted to discover was uh, about the cost and about the charging. Um, so the cost, three main things to do with it. Up front, um, overall, they're more expensive. At the moment, it's more expensive to get a petrol car, uh, a petrol car than a petrol car. Um, that's predictions are that's going to change in a matter of like maybe two years for the same sort of car. Well, the, the, the prices are going to are going to change. Um, but part of it as well is that the first cars that um, companies have put out have been their fancy show-off ones, their sports cars, their big SUVs. So they haven't been your small sort of Vauxhall Corsa, um, Volkswagen Polo type little cars. They've been the more expensive ones. There's that. Also, because they've only been around a few years, there isn't much of a second-hand market. So getting a, a perfectly decent car for five grand or 200 pounds is quite hard. There are things, but, you know, it needs time to, to settle into that. So, so to begin with, they are more expensive up front, um, uh, but that is going to change over the next couple of years, uh, and that's just yeah the crossover. Expecting very very soon for them to change. The maintenance though, and the fuel is is where it, it'll actually balance out. So if you are in a lucky position to be able to to get one, um, overall the costs could be the same or cheaper. When I factor everything in, running my car, my brand new at the time, where were we now, a year old car, over a year with all the cost of the MOT and the maintenance and the fuel, it costs the same per year as my old Honda Civic did. Um, so they're cheaper to maintain. That The rough idea is about 30% cheaper than a, a petrol car. There's a lot fewer components in them, a lot less to look after. There are many stories of people who have managed to have their cars going 300,000 miles, 400, 500,000 miles even, changing relatively little. Um, some of the stories with 300,000 miles, they're still on their first set of brakes. You don't need to change the brakes very often in an electric car. So very, very, uh, very low maintenance costs. Um, oh yeah, that's the story I was just saying. Uh, someone did uh, 300,000 miles. It's still on the original brakes and battery. Um, and then charging, so various ways of charging um, at home, uh, at destinations like, what have we got here? We've got uh, the Wilco, form, former Wilco's car park, uh, the cattle market car park, various supermarkets have them, um, or you've got lots of high speed ones on, on a motorway journey. In terms of finding one, I've done quite a few long journeys now, there's no shortage of finding one halfway down, you know, on a long journey, uh, if, if you need it there. The, there needs to be more. It would be better if there were more, but you don't find yourself too far from one, um, almost anywhere now. Um, and the, the costs of, uh, of that, so with your various options, um, so this is your worst case scenario, like filling up with petrol uh, on a motorway, um, the fast charging on a motorway. Quick calculations are you pay per, oh, hello, pay per uh, kilowatt hour. Um, rough idea of a battery size being 70, so you just multiply them. So to fill up on the motorway is about 45 pounds. Um, so you can compare that to your, your sort of petrol costs. Um, but if you can charge at home, the pence per kilowatt hour, instead of being 60, 70, 80, maybe perhaps is more like 30. So 21 pounds to fill up. Um, I, I never do that. I always charge overnight. There's tariffs. Octopus is the one I, I, I'm using there. Others are starting to do it. Uh, that's 9p per kilowatt instead, some are less, some are 7p. Um, so that's what I actually fill up for. It cost me £6.30 to fill up, uh, fill up my car um, if I charge overnight. So can't, can't work for everyone. A lot of this is to do with your personal circumstances, how much you drive, what your budget is. Do you have a driveway? Do you have the ability to fill up at home? That does, that does factor into it for the minute, but that, that can surprise people all the same. Um, and if you're wondering how many charges there are, um, that's, that's a map of uh, showing them all uh, in the country. Um, it's slightly cheating because that's all the speeds. That includes some of the slower ones at motorways. But if you just look at the really fast ones, there's still loads. There's still loads. So that's not, not been an issue um, I, I've found particularly as well. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's my overall experience. It's been um, uh, better. Than I got into it for the environmental reasons, and I've stayed for it being a great experience and a great um, 
uh, great in so many ways, and there's no way I'm going back to, to petrol after that. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to hand over to Bridget to talk about living a car-free life. Hi, everyone. So I'm Bridget Hickman. Um, I'm a director and co-founder of Windrush Bike Projects, and that will make some sense in a minute while I'm saying it's over in Whitney. Um, there were some slides coming up, and the first one you will see is me. That was, but I rode a bike then, and the next time I rode a bike regularly was probably in my 20s. There I am. So I'm going to talk to you about how a car-free life came about in our family. So I'm married to Kevin. I think his picture will come up in a moment. He's disabled. There he is. And we went to a talk over 20 years ago given by Paul Cullen and Clifford Jordan, who were instrumental in um, getting co-wheels in Oxford established. And they gave a talk on why car uh, driving isn't the problem. It was car ownership. And a lot of people have two cars in a family and they, always, they have the second one, a lot of families do, as a just-in-case car. And they felt that if there was a car club that was easy to use, people would more likely go down to one car. And where co-wheels were set up, which is what it's called now, was in Cowley, and the parking was changed in Cowley, where people couldn't just park on the roads. So a lot of people were getting rid of their second car, but they had a car club that they could go to. So when they had to go and buy something and transport it or needed a second car, they could just borrow one. So that set a seed in our mind. But I, we had a disability in our family, so that couldn't possibly work for us. But we did go down to one car and shared it. And this was until my husband had to go and do a year of working in Germany. Now, his disability means where he's lost his right leg, he can drive an automatic car, but he has to have a special adaption. So he took his Brompton with him, and that worked absolutely magnificently for him because he could ride his Brompton in Germany, no problem. He rode round the supermarket with a trolley, or a basket, I should say, and he did his shopping. And when he came home, he said to me, we could have a car-free life. And I said, oh, no way, that's not going to happen. We're being really good by having one car. So we carried on with one car, and it was his motability car that he had until I wrote it off. I drove into what I thought was a puddle in a flood, which was quite deep, and ended up having to be dragged out, and the car was written off. And through no fault of his, he was banned from having another motability car. And the punishment was, I was without a car for four weeks. So we were car free. Um, I had to get to work from Whitney to Abingdon. I was teaching in Abingdon, and I had to do two cars, or two buses, every day to get to work and home again. And um, we decided we wouldn't go for another motability car. I would lease a car. But those four weeks showed me we could lead a car-free life. Um, it wasn't great in Whitney because we only had buses, but we tried it. So four weeks later, I got my own lease car. And during the year that I was still teaching in Abingdon, we tried all sorts of different journeys of what, would we, what are we using the car for? And that gradually went down to, well, I'm only going to use the car to go to work. How else would I get my shopping? How would I um, get to see my family? How would we get on holiday? And gradually, we started to replace different journeys with the car with different ways of getting stuff and getting around. So yes, using the bus more, using the train more, and bought some trailers for the bikes. So we bought a series of Carry Freedom trailers of different sizes, and I got really, really good thigh muscles after that because I dragged that trailer everywhere with shopping in it. And it was hard work. So it did work for us. And a year later, I gave up my job in Abingdon at John Mason, had a bit of a um, sabbatical, took some time out, and we got rid of the lease car. And we went totally car free. And we did that in Whitney with a bus service. I joined a car club called Zip Car, and I joined the Co-Wheels Car Club in um, Cowley. The Zip Car worked for us because I could get the S1 bus service to the train station, get off and get into a car. If I was going the other way on the S2 bus, I could stop off on the Woodstock Road because they had some Co-Wheel cars there. Worked really, really well. And it sounds expensive, but once you get rid of a car, you haven't got that monthly payment all of the time. 
um, and you just spend a little bit more. I can't say how much we've saved on car buying, because we buy really good bikes, really expensive bikes. And in some of the pictures, you will see some of the bikes that we have. Um, we now have a cargo bike, which we bought when our granddaughter was coming along, and that was a total game changer. Um, so we can, we can take loads of shopping home now. I, can, I get in it. I think there's a picture of me in it so, at some point. Our granddaughter goes in it. That's the R factor there for you. She loves it. She's bigger than that now. She thinks she's the queen in it. She waves at everybody in it. Um, it's electric, um, so you can take quite a load in it without worrying about it being too heavy. We moved house recently to Bista. A lot of our stuff was in storage, so we got the stuff to storage, and every time we wanted something, we took it in the cargo bike and took it back to our house. So we've moved with it as well. Um, I'm on an electric bike, which, although I don't need it in Bista because it's flat, um, I do find when I come home late at night, um, I feel like I'm part of the traffic and I feel a bit safer because I'm going a bit faster, so I quite like that. Um, so that is, yeah, there's me being picked up from Mr. Village train station because um, I'd missed the bus and I didn't want to take my bike and leave it there, so I got a lift from, back from Mr. Village station. I'm the size of a sort of a year six child, so I do fit in it. Um, yeah, it's fun, it's great. So that's all the triumphs, but there are tribulations, and I think from what my fellow speaker was saying, it's not for everybody. A car-free life isn't for everybody. Um, we've made it work. Um, I'm going to talk about the weather. So the weather can be a bit of a problem when you're car-free. My husband um, rides this bike, the Trice, which is quite steady for him. Um, he can ride that with... Those are snow tires on that bike. So a snow tire, if you don't know about it, it's got little um, metal, like nails, but they're not nails, and they grip. So he can ride that, and he can ride a two-wheel bike with um, snow tires on as well. I don't have the nerve, I just walk myself. Um, so part of the trivial, you've got the weather. It doesn't rain as much as you think it does, actually. I ride a bike year in, year out, and I don't get wet that often. I've got the right gear, though, as well. Um, one of the other problems I would say is, I did say I touch on public transport. I do use public transport. Trains are expensive. Um, buses don't always marry up with the other transport that you're taking. Um, but it's a. But if you want to travel anywhere, and we do on holiday, and that's car free as well, we tend to see the journey as part of the holiday. It's interesting. We stop. We see more. So although the travelling can be a little more awkward, um, we just take it in our stride and make that part of the holiday. Um, I'm sure you'll ask me questions on what other the tribulations are, and I'm going to leave that to you. There aren't, I would say there are many more advantages to being car-free than there are to having a car. It's been very liberating not having a car. What are the um, triumphs? Well, it's, it is cheaper. Yes, definitely cheaper. Uh, healthier. I am healthier. Uh, it's more relaxed. Um, I've found, I think Catherine touched on it, that I've, I've found travelling in a car. I am not a great driver. That's why it was written off. It wasn't the only car I um, had accidents with. Um, I am a much safer cyclist uh, most of the time. Um, the surprise and advantages. I'm just going to have to read this because I had to really think about what the surprise and advantages were after I'd put it in my thing. Um, I'm more organised. If I go shopping and I don't want to go back out again, I have a list. I'm much more organised. If I'm going anywhere, I'm much more organised. I need to know where I'm going. I need to know my route. Um, I waste less because if you've dragged all your shopping up the hill on a bike, you don't tend to be throwing it away. Um, if I get home and I haven't got something, our meals can be very interesting. Um, if I don't want to go shopping, we use what's up. My husband with his disability, he found that um, once he started cycling, a lot of his aches and um, problems he was get, getting in, having, getting in and out of a car, ended. There are lots of people with a disability and lots of older people who cannot drive. So therefore, they are relying on getting themselves around on a bike, an adapted bike. Um, they might be using public transport more. Driving isn't for everybody. They can't drive. So that's part of um, why I like to talk about the car feeler, because I like to help people um, get to that stage. Um, Leisure-wise, all of our leisure, um, so we go cycle camping. Um, we don't fly either. 
So we get around by Eurostar. Um, we have to have a range of bikes because if you want to go on trains, you can't reliably take your ordinary bike on. So have fold up bikes to go on the train because you can always get those on because they're seen as luggage. Um, we are more social. Um, you talk more when you're side by side on a bike. You um, smile more. You, people want to talk to you about the different bikes you've got. Everybody always wants to talk to Kevin about how, how do you cycle. Um, I'll answer questions. I don't know if anybody's interested. Um, what would I like to see? I think we need to have better public transport. I think the least damaging transport for the environment needs to be the cheapest. That is not the case. Um, most people say, I've got a car, but when I look at traveling by train, it's more expensive. It's the wrong way around. It should be cheaper. There should be tax incentives if you've given your car up, for instance, or you go to electric. Um, we need to encourage more people, if they can, to do this or to have it as part of their life. It's a bit like the, being a vegan or a vegetarian. Maybe not every day of the week, but try it once or twice a week. Don't use your car at the weekend. If you're not going to work, try and use a different sort of transport. When I am on stalls talking about cycling for um, the project, People often say, well, you're trying to make us give things up. No, I'm giving you something back. Most people in villages are restricted to one sort of transport now. It's a car. We have taken away people's choices, and we ought to be giving them back. So it would be great if everybody could go by car. They could walk. They could cycle. Those are choices, not taking things away from you. And that's certainly what we found. Um, I think I've waffled on enough, actually. If anybody's got any questions at the end, please do ask. And thank you very much for listening. So I think we're ready to open the floor to questions. I have a question for Craig, which is um, something about you know, one of the reasons why a lot of people decide not to get an electric car is because they have on-street parking and they think that it's, it's very difficult to charge their vehicle. That's not something which is accessible to them. What would, you, what would be your response to that? Yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely more awkward. Um, you know, it's one thing to say they're going to put more charges in and, uh, around the place to make life easier, but that, you know, that only helps you in the future. Um, I think um, one of my slides showed you a couple of uh, uh, solutions they've got. Um, if you can park outside or near your house, there are ways of getting the cable to go through a guttering or out over the top, or maybe you can plug into a nearby lamppost. But that, that's certainly a um, you know, less preferable way of doing it, um, but, but might work if you can park outside your house, just there's a pavement to deal with. Um, but on the other hand, um, most people don't drive that many miles, so it depends what your, you know, situation is. Most people drive, I think it's uh, less than 20 miles a day. Um, a lot of the cars do a couple hundred miles. But, you know, they're going to be doing 300 miles. Um, so you, you you may only need to fill up once a week, like you do with a petrol car as well. So you can just treat it like that and just um, go once a week and fill up and leave it and park it wherever you want. So again, on the electric cars, um, do they have a, a, a backup charging system? So, for example, if you were going on holiday and you were going to be staying in a remote cottage somewhere uh, where it didn't have a charging point on site, is there something you can take with you that then plugs into a, a normal electric socket? Yeah, yeah, there is. Um yeah, I wouldn't expect to find uh, like a proper charging point in, in many places. Like some hotels are adding them in now, but I wouldn't expect to find that. I mean, like I say, what, one thing is you really don't charge up that much. The the worry about running out of uh, of, uh, of charge is um, you know n not something that people really encounter. I, I'll drive away to down to the coast for a weekend, drive around, see people do stuff, drive back again to Bista, and not not have needed to charge once. So. There's that side of it, but yes, it's nice to have that that reassurance, and um, you can charge off of a three-pin plug. Um, 
this summer's holiday, we, we stayed somewhere that um, uh, for a, uh, five days, and um, every night we would just plug it. It's, it's a lot slower that way, but we just plugged it in while we are in of an evening, and um, by the end of the holiday, I was full again, ready to go home. So, <laughs> so you can do that as well. Hi. Um, in Watlington, we've been looking into a, um, an app-based scheme where people can share their own cars. Um, I, I think it's called Hire Car, H-I-Y-A. Um, so that's an option people can look into. And also there's a, an equivalent, I can't remember what it's called, um, for car chargers that you can, um, people can pay to park on your driveway and use your charger. We're very lucky in that our parish council has just paid to have something like 10 um, chargers put into a public car park there so people that don't have um, off-street parking uh, are going to be able to, and there's even a fast one there. Um, but there's lots of schemes out there that you can, yeah, way, ways to make electric cars work. And also employers have a, a, a role to play there as well. You know, if your employer can install car chargers, something we're looking into at my workplace, um, and uh, salary sacrifice schemes for cars that are EVs. And there's two providers that do nearly new EVs as well because the most sustainable thing is the thing you already own, right? So don't go all chucking away your petrol and diesel cars just so you can get a brand new electric car. It's, it is better to keep on with the thing that you have until you need to replace it. Um, I've only ended up having two electric cars in my house because my husband wrote one off and I, I got rid of one um, when I it wasn't working and didn't need it. But um, thank you guys for your talk. It was really um, inspiring, especially living car free. That is a fantastic aspiration to aim for. Sorry, not a question. Thank you. Again, it's a, I'm afraid it's not a question. I was just thinking of some of the answers that uh, might be helping. You just mentioned one. Um, I think it's the county council. Is it? Anyway, the councils have been putting into the car parks. Um, that we've got two here in Bicester where you can go and charge your car overnight. The idea is that you come home from work, you live in the local area to the centre of Bicester, you haven't got off-street parking, so you can park your car into the two car parks or one of the two car parks charge your car overnight, come back in the morning, pick up your car, fully charged, and off you go to work. So the, we, we're doing that. Um, there's ones um, you mentioned in Watlington. There's ones in Abingdon. There's ones in Banbury. Well, Banbury's absolutely full of charges anyway. But, uh, and there's also ones in here in, um, in Bicester. And if I could just extend something from what you were saying about electric bicycles. Of course, if you want to go a little bit farther, and you want to go electric, you can get an electric motorcycle. Now, an electric bike is limited by a 250 watt motor, 15.5 miles an hour. If you want to go faster than that, then it becomes a motorbike and you obviously have to do all the things, you know, crash helmet, all the stuff that goes with it. But there are electric motorcycles around and they are very quick and they will do 200 miles. And so you get all the advantages of a bicycle, in other words, less congestion, less um, uh, pollution because you're riding a motorcycle, it's only got two wheels, it's only got two tyres, and uh, of course you can go the longer distances as well, and it's quiet, just all the advantages of a car but without the congestion. It's just a little promotion for the one in between bicycles and cars. Thank you, sorry, sorry I was... Um, nobody's mentioned electric scooters. <laughs> kind of, I, I blank them out if I can, because I, 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 as a pedestrian, I, I just think they're so dangerous. The way that kids drive them and they don't wear crash hats and all that sort of thing. But um, is there going to be a real future? Is there going to be accommodation on our roads for scoop for electric scooters? Um. Yeah, I mean, my, my initial thoughts, I, I think, um, potentially, I think, um, but your experience is probably pretty common because of how they've been launched into society. They've been put out there as something for drunk tourists to go on. Um, 
and that's, that's how they're mostly used and then found in the canal you know, in the next week. Um, so it's probably not a representative of what could be done with them. Um, and there could well be a good place for that being a, you know, a quick, safe, environmentally friendly form of transport, um, potentially. Did you have something? only in the sense that they're all illegal. So a policeman should be able to take them, confiscate them, crush them, which is what I'd like to see. They are only allowed on the roads. They're not allowed on footpaths, and they ride them on footpaths, so that's annoying. Um, if they go faster than 15.5 miles an hour, then they become motorcycles, exactly as I was saying before. In fact, they are, in effect, motorcycles. You have to have a license to drive one. If you drive it on the road and you get caught, you can get points on your license. And a lot of the people who ride these things don't realize that. Now, the only ones that are legal are the ones that are out for trials at the moment. There's a trial in Oxford, I believe, going on at the moment. And so you can, you can just take one of those. But you have to say that you've got a license. Those are also maintained to a good standard. And they're also insured, which is the other thing. I mean, these ones that are privately owned, if somebody runs into somebody else walking, exactly as uh, Pam was saying, you know, those people are not insured. You could sue the hell out of them because they're illegal and they're not insured. They need to be either made legal, which they have in other countries, and again, they're then allowed to ride on, usually on cycle tracks, I think in places like Paris and places like that. But I believe Paris has banned them now, haven't they? So they are an awkward thing in between what I call active travel, when you see kids riding, and there was a couple of kids here with, with scooters that you actually push along with one foot. That's what I call an active travel scooter. The one where you just stand there and hurtle about is also sometimes called active travel, which I find really odd because you don't do anything <laughs> but other than crash. Thanks very much, I really enjoyed the panel. Um, so I'm Callum Miller, I'm a county councillor, and I was really interested in, the, in what you all spoke about in terms of mixed mode, so reducing how much you use a car, but still being able to use a car at times. Um, and I think, Bridget, what you were saying about um, bus travel is a real challenge, so people who have followed it will know that uh, the, the patronage, the number of people using buses has really tailed off since the pandemic and has come back in big cities but hasn't come back so much in other areas and that reflects the fact that people went out because they didn't have a choice and bought cars or they felt uncomfortable sharing spaces in public transport so we've all got a challenge to think about how we restore that patronage one of the things we're doing at the county council is introducing some more community routes so smaller buses, sort of 16 seater minibuses to try to see if we can make them economically viable but when I started looking at it as a new councillor, the, the cost of subsidising Stagecoach or whomever to run a service which they deemed uh, uneconomic was eye-watering. I mean, it could be a quarter of a million pounds a year to keep one service going by the time you've taken account of the, uh, of the capital cost of the vehicle and then the, the drivers to keep a service running through the day. So it was really, say, on the, on the bus side, uh, I think we've all got to put our kind of collective minds to it and think how we can get the interface you know, between getting your bike on the bus and off it. I got frustrated with stagecoach the other day who told me my Brompton was too big and wasn't allowed on. Um, you know, that kind of thing is really frustrating. How can we make those interfaces better? Um, the question I had, uh, I guess, for Catherine and Bridget, so I'm a routine commuting cyclist, and a lot of people say to me they would cycle, but they can't really face the winter months, or they don't just cycle from A to B, so if they arrive at a meeting drenched, what are they supposed to do? So I'd love to know your top tips, uh, what clothing to wear, and how to stay dry and happy through the winter months um, so that we can encourage more people to use a bike uh, on a regular basis, even between kind of business meetings and so on. Thank you. Absolutely. So, yeah, when I'm talking about motivators on those cold, dark nights, especially when it's raining, wanting to turn up presentable is, is really important. Um, top tips, breathable, waterproof trousers, because they need to be breathable because you don't want to end up as wet inside as you are outside. And breathable, waterproof jackets is a big one. Um, certainly, you know, anecdotally, from my point of view, helmet hair is a big one. There are so many, you know, the internet is a huge place now. There are so many bloggers who can help you with helmet hair, um, who can help you with hairstyles that, that are going to survive and you can look presentable because we're coming off of Zoom and back into in-person meetings and 
you know, high resolution um, is definitely worse for me on some days than low resolution on the computer screen. Um, so those are my top tips and a good pair of shoes, um, Gore-Tex shoes, waterproof shoes. But like Bridget was saying, being organized. If you know where you're going and you can pack a bag, you can travel in, you know, cycling clothing and you can quickly get changed to your destination. You just need to be a little bit more organized. Um, but yeah, that's my top tip. And just um, before I hand over to Bridget, just to touch on what you're saying about allowing bikes on public transport, that's a big issue that we come up against. Um, to get your bike, for example, onto a bus, it needs to be folding. And there's not always consistency across bus providers as to whether they'll allow a Brompton on and whether that Brompton needs to be packaged somehow. So you think, okay, I've got my folding bike, I can get onto the bus, and now they're saying, no, it needs to be, needs to be covered, and it needs to be fully covered, and you don't have a bike bag with you. Trains, similarly, you know, people are traveling in peak times, and it's not an all or nothing approach. We want people to be using multimodal transport. Um, but if you can't take your normal size bike onto a train, and all of a sudden you need to be investing in something like a Brompton, which isn't cheap, and that suddenly throws up a huge number of barriers to somebody doing their work commute when they could be using public transport for part of it. Um, so yeah, we, we really do beg the train companies to start allowing standard bicycles on, start allowing more space. As they're designing new fleets, they want new electric fleets, so they're designing whole new trains, and we want them to be making more room for bicycles so people can cycle a very short distance, get to their destination, cycle another short distance, because BIST has two train stations. It's, it's ready for, for more multimodal transport. So I'm a bit of a scruff bag. <laughs> I decided not to do helmet hair, so I just had all my hair cut off. That works really well. Um, the other thing is I keep a set of clothes, because I have to commute from Bicester to Whitney. Um, although I moved to Bicester, um, I own the bike project with another lady over in Whitney and um, she wouldn't let me leave. So I have to go back two days a week and I work a day from home. So I, it, that is multimodal for me. I, I cycle to the station or down to the bus stop and then I catch either the bus or the train into work. But if I've got wet on that journey down it, just into Bicester, um, I could be wet all day because I won't have dried out by the time I get to work. So I keep a set of clothes at work, so that really works for me. Um, I don't own a single thing that you would say cycle clothing, to be honest. I have stuff that um, works just on a bike. Because um, I'm ve very short, I find a company called Crag Hoppers do clothing that really fits me, and it does it in fabric that is, in, that is breathable. Um, so I go to something you know, that works for me. Um, and I have some over trousers and things like that that are boiling in the bag, but um, I don't use those very often. But I do find I, I, I just get wet and just eventually dry. <laughs> so I don't think I find a great solution, but just having being organised and having a set of clothes you can change into. And don't cycle fast, you know, and then you don't get to the other end all sweaty. And if you are sweaty, have some baby wipes, sort yourself out. No, that, that sort of thing, because um, where I am, we're lucky to have a set of toilets, never mind a shower. So, uh, yeah. This is actually a comment rather than a question, because Bridget and I were having this uh, conversation earlier in the day. It doesn't happen that often, I, I reckon. We shouldn't overstate the horrors. Um, I uh, commuted in a, in a city for 20 years, and I, and I thought, actually, how often, you know, it might have rained at some point on that day, but was it raining between 8.45 and 9? Quite likely not. So, so the number of soakings per year is not that great. And the second thing I would say was that I was recently uh, looking at, um, is it Mike Berners-Lee's He's, he's the kind of environment, yeah. He said he's a hardened cyclist and he found pe people don't really mind very much if he looks a little bit sort of scruffy when he turns up to, to a meeting. They, they just take that as, you know, that's who he is and how he is. So I'm, I'm saying d don't let's think it's a huge barrier.
I was just going to add to that that um, I met Jeremy Paxton when we were in at an event in London, and uh, he turned up on his bike and um, he whipped out his, um, his 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 jacket and whacked it on. I thought he looked still quite presentable, and I asked him. I said, "Well, how do you how do you manage this?" And he said, "Well, it's just about trying to get the right fabric in the." Uh, in the, in, in the suits I buy, and then I can still come out and look reasonably pra- presentable. And I thought it's actually quite phenomenal. So I think those kind of things are quite interesting as well. Um, I don't ride, I have never ridden a bike. I would love to ride a bike, but I'm quite um, old. <laughs> so my concern would be other traffic if I even tried to learn so how do you feel about that because um, there's always this uh, animosity between cars and cyclists so can you comment on that yeah absolutely so our ethos in Bisterberg is very much that cycling should be accessible for everybody um, what we, you know, our vision is to have segregated cycleways, segregated from the motor traffic on the highway and segregated from pedestrians as well. Pedestrians don't want to share paths with bikes. Um, It doesn't always feel safe. It's not always inclusive to everybody across that path. So we also like to have segregation on the highway. It gives room for bikes to make the odd mistake every bike user, as every driver, will always make the odd mistake or um, the odd wobble. What we don't want is just to have people in Bista cycling who are confident on a bike and really good at it. We want it to be open for everybody um, of any age. And what we need is space in order to be able to become more confident and to be able to make the odd wobble without it um, feeling unsafe around the motor traffic, without feeling unsafe around pedestrians. So that's really what we are pushing for in Bista, and it's happening very, very slowly. Um, there are certain areas of Bista where you see full segregation of the highway, um, and it just makes everybody feel a lot safer, and it feels a lot safer within your path. So, yeah, I hope that kind of answers your concern. Yeah. 